I want to welcome everyone to um, our second in the fallback uh, lecture series. I'm going to turn it over to you, Sean, to introduce one of the most, I would say, inspiring designers today. And yeah. it's not biased because I've known Vanessa since 1993. Uh, Sean, if he doesn't know this, I will tell him, Vanessa, a little secret that Vanessa and I did graduate work together. We went to graduate school together. So we have a huge history. So I'm gonna disappear and I'm gonna pop back when you're ready All and right. uh, take it away. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Vanessa, it's so great to see you. So I, nice I, to see I, you, Sean. I don't get to see you enough, obviously. And I, it's, it's sort of like, Gloria, I don't know if you know this either, Vanessa, but before I met you, you know, officially, you were like a legend. Um, you know, Stephen Doyle talked about you all the time as being like the most talented designer he'd ever worked with, the best color person on the planet. And so it was, it was like, you were, it, I knew about you long before we actually met. And then, I know, we had such good time together that, that trip we did to Buenos Aires with Paula. And, um, Remember? And Stephen and Gail, that was great. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that was fun, but we need more of those, you, Sean. We, we need, need more, more of like, those. Let's do another you know? one. Yes. Those encounters of, yes. of creators around the world. And um, but the, the Vanessa is an Art Center alum, and um, and Gloria is one hundred percent right. There is nothing I see that from Vanessa that doesn't blow me away. And I'm like just this morning, I was I was um, the the Mexico origin book is so gorgeous. <laughs> So, um, well, I'm going to turn it over to you, Vanessa, so you can talk about um, whatever you are, and we're so lucky to have you. I'm so, I, I wish you were here in person to give you a big hug, but. Well, I thank you for having me. I mean, for everybody that's out there, I have both history with Gloria and Sean, which in my world, that means true meaning, because um, I value humanity above anything else. You know, we can talk about design all day long, but this is what's truly important, and and it's a pleasure to be here with you, Sean. Really, really a pleasure. Good, so, good, good. All right. Well, holler out if you need What do I do? Numbers. I share the screen. Share the and screen I, and okay. chat. Okay. okay, so where do I start? Um, this is Block. Uh, you know, I, I, I was invited to talk about my career, but honestly, you'll see that I'm not linear in thought or in action. So I'm going to go... Uh, the way we normally do it a block, which is very experimental um, and very intuitive. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are the places from Buenos Aires uh, that I've lived in and moved from Buenos Aires to Art Center in LA, to New York, back to LA, to Toronto, where I opened block, moved it to Mexico, back to Toronto, moved it to Berlin for two months and back to Toronto. That means that um, uh, borders have crossed me uh, instead of vice versa. And we, we, our, our essence it has always been a nomadic spirit. This has informed everything we do. Uh, the, one of the reasons I put this image, which is uh, an artist's work, Laws of Disassociation, is for you to understand that my world, a world in my mind, actually looks like this. It is always about the inspiration, about the thoughts, about the people, about the personal experience, that influence our work. And uh, because I said I was not gonna be linear, this is more or less we, how we work uh, in reality. I come from Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina. Obviously this map is upside down, but because it's from an art artist, Torre Garcia. And the reason I put it here as well is because this is, uh, my north is my south, this uh, image is, is called. And everything we've seeked to, from the beginning of my career, was to rethink the world. And I, I have been attracted to people that are always trying to challenge the preconceptions. Um, I think society is built by a narrative and I like the periphery. I like the thinking that is always in the edge that is informing our work, but also is informing where we can go as a society. And this is Olaf, Olaf Aurelius' last project. Uh, and I just like the idea of these similarities that show up between, you know, uh, decades between different countries and how they affect each other. Everything is a conversation. For me, art is life and life is art. And this is what influences everything we do at the studio. This is Mata Clark uh, for the Pompidou when the Pompidou was being built in Paris. He literally made holes in the buildings 
for you to understand the project from a different perspective. And the reason why I'm showing you this before I start talking about block is because this is how we see every single project in our studio. We don't get jobs. We literally make, make jobs, make projects. This is a experience that we create with the clients. It's not what comes to us, but what we're able to push forward and the spaces we're able to carve. And this is, oh my goodness, one of my favorite artists, Cristo, and how he uncovers, reveals the same building you've ever always seen, but you see it anew because something has transformed you in the process. We're utopist by nature. We have always been political before political was something in fashion. Um, and we've always been in the resistance to fight against anything that we don't find fair in the world. I come from a military dictatorship. That was my background when I grew up. And I think that everything that uh, we are made for, our personal experiences, insinuate themselves in our work. It shapes you, you're molded, uh, both by the experiences you have, but also by the people that you've met. So always honor, always honor the people that have taught you through your career, uh, because this, this is the influence of everything we do. And, you know, this, this actually are photos of when I grew up. Um, so there's a very special word in my life, which is called freedom. Uh, Tolstoy used to say, uh, freedom, freedom is the content, necessity, the form. And the freedom not only comes when you become political or when you start talking about equality, it actually also comes about the work you do, how you look at it, how you find those opportunities to express uh, values. And values can be expressed as, as a company, as an organization, as a nonprofit, as an art institution, and as a person. And this, I love it. This is Duma from Argentina, making fun of a very hard and harsh history. So there's angles in which we can tell the same story from different perspectives. So these are our beliefs in block. Um, we've always stood with very strong philosophy from the beginning. One is idealism is a precondition. The other one, uncertainty is intrinsic to process. Slant to shift your perspective. Easy is soulless. And chaos is a way of thinking. So today, instead of just talking to you about what we've done in the studio, I'm going to guide you through our values and uh, come, come with me on this ride to just show you what we've done with all of these projects. Um, so as we were saying, and I was sharing, uh, politics has always been part of who I am as a person. Um, we've been involved in social issues, in issues that um, have to do with uh, basically awareness of changing society or fighting for equality since the beginning of our career. Actually, my, my exhibit at Art Center had to do with my own experience. This is important to us because we do have a voice in society and our voice doesn't have to be large. It could be small or it could be large, but we have the possibility to create ripple effects. Um, this is for the Center of Political Graphics. I actually met them when I was at Art Center. So it's one of the great gifts I got at Art Center. I was doing my master's thesis and my master's uh, exhibit and meeting Carol Wells from the center um, who presented with me a poster of the, the military dictatorship of a kid holding the logo of the World Cup as if he were in jail. It was a profoundly moving for me. And for the last 25 years, I've been close to Carol. We were able to design their identity not long ago. And now we're working on a book on systemic racism. So that's one of the things we're doing during COVID. All of this um, accompanies not only the, the, the thinking of the work we do, but just the power of what we love to do. Uh, you know, and the logo comes back also as words, as posters, as protests, as purpose. I, I have some case studies I'm gonna walk you through, but now I'm gonna just guide you through a couple of projects that have a philosophical value to what we do. Uh, part of the political posters. And, you know, yes, the Black Lives Matter, many years before we're seeing it here and we're so happy to, to be able to have this conversation openly as a society. 
uh, in this case, the logo had to open itself to be able to bring all these posters, which are the essence of the organization. It has 90,000 posters, the biggest collection around the world. And it has not only American, but international. Uh, people forget that uh, when, you know, when you're in a dictatorship, you actually die by doing a poster. It's not just a designer stating a comment on the world or making a commentary. Your life is in danger. The people around you are in danger. So for me, coming from where I come from, every single one of these posters holds a very, very profound value, not only of thought, but of life and death. And, and this is what we try to honor in, in presenting, that every poster has its weight and its value. We've been in this conversation many years as well. Uh, we did a book for Park close to 17 years ago. This was Equality in Golf. We came up with a name, uh, we developed the concept, uh, it accompanied a documentary on um, racism uh, in the game. And again, you know, 17 years ago, there weren't that many books about this subject. Uh, it was actually shocking to learn how that, you know, till the 70s, uh, uh, a black man could, uh, couldn't actually play golf, and especially in the PGA. Um, oblique, diagonal, and zigzag moves reveals the play of human freedom. As we talked about, freedom is something you don't value till you lose it. And for me, it's always been the one thing I've, I've held really strong to. I think the, the older I get, the, the more important this becomes and the wilder my heart goes. And you'll see it in the projects uh, we've developed. Uh, with the, um, this project is Wayward Arts. I'm looking at my time and making sure that I'm not going too, too slow. Um, and this is our normal wall. Just so, so this is my happy place. This is the studio. This was research for this, this publication that we were doing. And this wall is all art, humanity, and politics. Words, um, phrases, movements. And we had to distill from here the content. But this is important because this is what feeds us. We think that we see all these exhibits and how do they show up in our life again? And creativity is about that. It's about creating these interconnectedness. Um, inspiration is consistent and is always. Dante used to say imagination is when it rains. And I love it because that's exactly what it is. We're constantly absorbing everything around the world that will feed us. And suddenly there's a project where it all comes to play. For me, this was one. And all the people that I admire, all the projects that I admired came to play here. Wayward Arts, uh, this was a publication we did for Canada. And it was about the idea of counter culture and culture always being the same. So every single piece of work here is somebody who looked at the world differently. From politics, we, we had to call photographers, each one of these pieces, nobody came to us. We, we actually produced and thought about this project. Each one of these um, photographs, artists, we actually had to call and get rights to reproduce. In this one, we had um, uh, uh, Tahir Square, Ferguson, and, um, and, in this, and the Olympics. And we had Mandela, which we, we were able to get images from Magnum and superimposed it with a surrealist event. And th sometimes these are the dialogues that become so very interesting, that it's not just about the image, but what other level of thinking, of conversation, can you actually find when you bring two images completely different into one conversation? Mandela, I actually have to admit, is my hero. He has always been um, I, an idealist at heart. He stood for four hours before his trial, four hours, talking about equality. Um, making art, making change, we're involved in many organizations that are working with art to shift society. I'm also many times involved in the boards of them. Um, this, is, uh, this is Not My Toy, which is a project that brings again art and street graphics into one. One of my favorite philosophers once said, um, the limit of your language is the limit of your world. So it's not just about your verbal language. It is also about your uh, visual language. In getting inspiration from all these artists are consistently feeling 
feeding who we are as a studio. This is the exhibit at the Design Exchange. And Think Global Institute, we did this project recently. And again, it's about rethinking the possibilities, the new thing for the new possible. We're always interested in the edge of things. I, I, I discovered not long ago that actually my favorite place is the edge. And it's not the graphical edge or the perceived edge that we normally are accustomed. My edge is the one that takes risks, but the risks are always that point where I'm still grounded and I'm ready to fly and I'm ready to leap. The risks are not just, uh, you know, what typography we're gonna use, but actually how can we shift something that will move or that will ripple effect. Um, you know, sometimes there are gestures that, that make a revolution. They're not the biggest change. And sometimes those changes are the ones that trigger a tipping point in society. So working with people that are thinking within larger visions, um, sometimes poets, sometimes critical thinkers, strategists, but many times the artists and the writers is a place that we like to, to live in. Uh, the studio in and of itself is a very porous studio. We're always uh, in a state of becoming. I think that we become by doing and every, every project is, is an exploration. Um, and I, I think that we have a little bit of a poetic soul. So we're always between the magical and the intangible, uh, you know, randomness things that happen, you know, we don't even believe in failure. We believe in trying a million times. Uh, and, and if it's not good enough, we try again. And if it's not good enough, we try again. All of these things are part of a spirit of experimentation. So uncertainty is definitely intrinsic to our process. So what did we do? Um, you know, I, I, I find that I need my personal incentive. Sometimes I think that's what moves me most. So a couple of years ago, I had the idea of moving the studio to uh, block to Berlin uh, to just explore what we could do there. Art Center actually does it as well, which uh, we, we, we coincided when we were there at the time. Uh, but for a design studio, it's not that easy. You have to pay tickets, find apartments, find a space. Uh, if you have somebody that is very rational, they look at the numbers of what this costs and they say, definitely not. It makes no sense whatsoever. The good news is I am very rational when I want to and I, I am totally irrational when I choose to. It works very, very much to my advantage. So we decided to, uh, this is the team, to take our team to Berlin. And we did all that. We rented apartment space. We had no idea what apartments we were going to go to. Uh, we had no idea, I'll keep it in the, in, the, in the faces. We had no idea what that space looked like. We didn't know if there was printers. We, we had no idea what clients were gonna come with us. We are, we are a studio of, these are, this is my team of six people. And um, we take on projects per project. We don't do retainers. I think it kills creativity. So we, we are risk takers in, all, in every way, which also meant we truly didn't understand uh, if our clients would love this idea or not. Uh, the, my gut and my intuition said that they would and actually they ended up uh, loving it. Uh, all the projects that we worked on in Berlin, none were from Toronto and that was pure luck. One was from Hong Kong, two from Mexico, one from LA, it was, it was incredible. But this is, the, this is the essence of my philosophy and this is John Cage. Um, the only structure which permits of natural activity in, is one so flexible as not to be a structure. I write in order to hear. Never do I hear and then write what I hear. Inspiration is not a special occasion. This is important to me because I think we, we always perceive life to be clear for others and not ourselves. In my case, I actually embrace my non-clarity because it is, it is the space of creativity that truly pushes me to do things that are uncomfortable, that are unconventional, that I have no idea what the results are gonna be. You, don't, you have no idea on a, on, a, on, a, on a project like this, on just going to work out of there. What are the repercussions? Uh, our Berlin, uh, actually that's Toronto. <laughs> Funny enough, this was, that's why we put it. This is actually the CN Tower of Toronto and we ended up living next to the tower in Berlin. So we love that association. And this is the team walking into the streets and our flight. 
some people in my studio, Chris had never left Toronto. So it was the first time jumping on a plane. All of these experiences, that humanity is priceless. We, for me, the most important thing is that this space that we've created at Block is a space that we actually love to go to. We, we care for the people, we, we're all caring for each other. So sharing this was just maybe one of the biggest gifts. Um, what we, you know, this all yellow that we found in the city reminded us of the only, the, the one thing we had. Everything we had from Block fit in that box, in that yellow box. And we kept on laughing that if they stole that, they would steal all our computers, our little books, our pantons, because that's the only thing we took to Berlin. And the first day I arrived there, um, I picked up a book in the corner, a completely different book. Uh, and this is about serendipity uh, and found this tiny book on architecture, a type that I couldn't recognize. I honestly don't know all the typeface, there's so many. But by chance, I looked for the uh, typographer and he was a Swiss art, uh, typographer. Have, um, uh, this typography is Inter. And, um, and I emailed him because I couldn't find it anywhere. It was a new type, it hadn't been launched and I fell in love with it. We had one project, the one that Sean referred, um, uh, Origen Mexico. And I asked him, and it, this book was, it, it's all about uh, all, all the people, ideas, thoughts that illuminated from Mexico to the world. So it was origin, what was originated in Mexico, there was new, there was authentic, there was unique, creative, and how, it, and how that, that repercussion happened in the world. So to be, to be able to get a typography that hadn't even been launched, to actually reflect in the design itself, that same intent of the content of the book was as important as the type itself. These are synchronicities that happened to you. You know, had I not been in Berlin, had picked up this book, gone to the corner, emailed him, and had he not been so lovely, I wouldn't have been able to get this book, to get this type, and we did. And that's where you'll see it. This was our studio in Berlin, shared space, um, and this was Inter, and this was our wall. So this wall, this book that I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about, uh, when they gave it to us, had a very different format, and we decided to affect the design and the content. We always affect the content. We are not a studio that people give us work. We actually always um, affect the type of work that we do. And um, so again, one of our favorite walls. And when you look a little bit closer, you start seeing the imagery, the type of meticulous analysis we had to do to find every image of this entire alphabet of a book. Uh, and this is our process. It's always very physical, very sensitive. It has a lot of sensibility. We care a lot about materiality. Uh, we always dummy, we see the pacing. Books are like music. They have rhythm and they have pacing and you actually need to feel it. When it's an alphabet, you don't have that possibility as much. So you, so you need to be able to move through the book um, and, and curate it. With, with that understanding of, of rhythm. So the book um, was an alphabet. Uh, we tried to explore, this was this going to Berlin was, an, was conceptually, the idea was to um, leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. You know, we spend most of the time in our lives, 90% of your every day is familiar. Maybe if you're lucky, 5% is unfamiliar. When you move yourself into another place, 90% is unfamiliar and that other 10% is familiar. So that idea, that shifting on perspective was important to us, you know, that, I, that concept of um, moving to a new place, not to see a new view, but actually to change your eyes, to change how you see, to break your own patterns. So in doing that, we knew we wanted to challenge our ideas. This paper you see here, this yellow, this pink paper is um, blueprint paper. It's actually the, the, like carbon paper, like the third paper, the one that you throw away when you do a carbon print. We loved it. We decided we were gonna print on it. And all these new things showed up that we, did, we weren't, that we had no idea, the transparency. Uh, this is, the reason this is here is because we had this yellow cover 
in our book that we had designed. And then when we went to Spain to print it, what happened is that yellow disappeared and we couldn't see it on the paper. Uh, this is our printing process. So, and this is all our text on our carbon, which we again didn't know was so transparent. So suddenly all these nuances of experimenting in new materiality and what it brings to you as a designer. And here you have Origen Mexico. Uh, the yellow ended up becoming a pink, which we mixed at the printer. This, I think, is one of the things I love most about the work we do. We're always experimenting. We're always pushing it. And if it doesn't work, we try something else. We make it happen one way or the other. And we ended up mixing this. There's no Pantone for this pink. We mixed it there with the guys at the back. And we, um, and we ended up liking it more. the inside covers and back covers. Um, you know, this sounds silly, but sometimes, you know, images like the ones you see at the back, the image isn't good enough and we need to explore and push it to make sure that the, this image is, is at level. We ended up also curating this book and getting fighting, fighting actually almost. I, I, I don't know if it was fighting, but I, it feels like it would have been fighting for the rights of these uh, to publish a lot of these images as well. And um, the inside cover, the inside pages, you go from Buñuel, uh, who worked in Mexico, to Diego Rivera. And this is how it felt. Our index is on the cover. Um, again, this idea that why, why, why aren't we presenting the book as is? If this is the, this important, then our index should be the cover. And this is the exploration of the process of, of the pink materiality. Slant to shift perspective, as you've seen, this is the essence of everything we work with. Um, we're always trying to see, you know, sometimes, and, and I think that this is maybe a little bit of the thought, the thinking behind it. Uh, sometimes we perceive that shifts have to be huge, that change has to be huge. And instead, many times it is the gesture that actually makes that profound distinction. Sometimes you move a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and you perceive the world differently. And this is, what happened to us with this project uh, for cannabis. So Block is a small studio. We get projects from around the world, um, uh, honestly, from Hong Kong to Chile. We get huge projects like in Chile, 300,000 uh, square uh, meet, feet. I'm trying to see which one of the two uh, projects. And then we get a book, which we love to do, or we get a, a nonprofit. Like we move in scale because scale isn't what defines what we do. What defines what we do is the value of the content or does it have a possibility to open opportunities or does it have a possibility to challenge? We like things that are gonna make us learn and make us grow. I mean, curiosity is for me, a wild beast. We plan never to tame. And, um, and that, that curiosity, that constant hunger to do what we love to explore different forms, different materiality, to be uncomfortable. This is a playground. And if ever you think that it's all about the client and the studio, it is actually not in our studio and it never has been. Uh, I always say, you know, that I'd I, I love clients where that I can sit down at three in the morning and have the best conversations. I never know why I say three in the morning. It's always three in the morning. But I think because if it's three in the morning, we've lasted a night of deep, wonderful, enriched conversation. That type of client normally aligns in value, normally is doing things that matter. And sometimes we have these projects with a really big challenges. This is cannabis. Cannabis was um, becoming legal. And, um, and what happened was they, I had many, many calls in, uh, to do projects in Canada, and I was not sure if to take them on, which now seems incredible. But four years ago, I thought, is this a project I want? What do I tell my son, my kids? Actually, my son questioned me and he said, mom, you always say, you know, you, you didn't take tobacco and you're taking cannabis. 
And I had to think about why I was doing this. But obviously, my, I, did, I took it because I thought I could, I, I, I cared. I thought there was incredible knowledge to be learned and incredible good things that could happen. And as always, things go from one extreme to the other and you need to do things with thoughtfulness and respect. So uh, the beauty of this project is that cannabis was gonna be legal, but it wasn't when we got the job. We couldn't show cannabis. This was our research um, board, which as you see has more cactuses than cannabis. And it was crazy to be able to design a project um, based on an emotion. So instead of plants and the, the plant itself, we literally did strokes, green strokes. Uh, this is our studio, this is how we work. And this is our team. Actually, if you look at it, they're working, they're working on CSPG as well. So these happen simultaneously. Uh, the cannabis plant, which we were like, you know, drawing because we couldn't photograph and we don't know how to show it in a way that wouldn't reflect. We had a thousand million laws. So all of this is exploration for the project. And this is 48 North. This is the brand. Uh, when it launched, remember, nobody was, there was no brands in this area very well designed. So for us, this was an incredible challenge to, to explore. I wasn't even a smoker, so I had to learn so much about it, um, which also made me um, an interesting person to be working on it because I, I truly had to see, I, I had that other perspective that wasn't the mainstream perspective of somebody who actually had lived with cannabis and was, uh, you know, believed in it and used it and, and, and their lifestyle also um, was surrounded by it. Uh, so as you see, we have exploration, um, you know, the, the shadows is a normal plant, it's definitely not cannabis. So these were our ways of exploring how to say the subject or, or feel the subject without actually showing the subject. And then, you know, we, we decided that we've, <laughs> we're going to push it further. And from the day one, so just to have an idea, when we present a project, we don't just go to where they tell us to go. We just go much further. If we want to go further, we go. So we presented product and an entire concept of product development the day we presented the brand, as much as presenting a magazine. And what's interesting in that is that we actually were able to do it. Um, and this is the full, you know, a couple of images of the, of, of the project and the first sort of more corporate magazine. And this is our board. Uh, you know, images are always flying in our studio, photography, typography, art that inspires. So what ended up happening is we not only did the, the identity, we did a publication, we had told them, you should be doing a magazine. And this was four years ago. This year, we not only edited the magazine, but we, we designed the magazine. We also curated the content. We're in charge of all the art direction and the thinking and, and the journalism in the edition as well. What we wanted to make sure is this, this magazine actually had content. Um, you know, I, to me, the, we're putting too much bad stuff in the world to add more. It, it, it truly has to be thoughtful. If we're gonna put this subject, let's do it responsibly. Let's do it with issues that are important. Uh, this is the studio and, and how we normally are working with a project, uh, even the photography that we are direct. And what was very interesting about this project was that we uh, had to print it, uh, COVID hit and we, there was no printers. So we at the end, COVID hit us at the end of the design, we, we had to all go home, finish the job in our homes and print out of a parking lot. And this is where I...
I do think that design has always been guided by, by concepts of clarity, you know, the problem solving, synthesis by design, but design is so much more and it does have the power, I think as art has, to question what is relevant and immediate, uh, sort of to distill only our messages, but also our humanity. And, um, and in society, these questions are asked through many of the projects we do. And these are the opportunities we have as designers to actually begin conversations, to question, to be relevant, to challenge. And we don't always have to have the answers. I think that raising the questions as, is as important or even more important than having the answer. And I think that type of uh, thinking is the, what, the, what has always fed our design. Um, also, like the, the idea of for, forging emotional connections, uh, of bending the boundaries, you know, of what we assume to be acceptable. Uh, this was the, so just to go back to this project, COVID hit, we had a printed magazine and we had no digital magazine. So we had to pull this in a month. Everything that was printing, uh, create a digital version of it, which we had already told our clients to do, and they didn't have the budget. But then clearly when COVID happened, the budget uh, surprisingly showed up. And um, but we are incredibly thankful for their support because without clients that actually are this open, and maybe this is what I want to say about this project as well, is that you do not, you're not able to take on a project like this, like 48 North, with latitude, with products, without the support of incredible open-minded clients that trust you. And the, key, and the key is to trust, to work incredibly collaboratively. We not only designed the products, as you see, we, we did a grinder, uh, very much looks like, if you ask me, like all these images we saw on our wall from the beginning, which inspired them. And we got into product design. Why? Because we wanted to because we wanted to experiment, because we wanted to explore, because we've always thought that the Eames had it better than anybody else. They explored architecture, product, education. And I, I, it exhilarates me and it excites me to cross fields, to cross boundaries. Um, design for me is not only thought, but it's felt. And we can explore it in many, many ways. Uh, and I think as, as I keep on going in my career, I have so much more to do. To, to keep on pushing myself into this space. And obviously I'm not alone. My, my, my everything you see is team and I have one of the best teams I could ever possibly hope so, uh, or wish for. So this is what you know, we do. And it, it, it's interesting how a studio changes when product becomes part of the graphics and it all inspires each other. We did the packaging, again, pushing our idea of packaging. Packaging is sewn by hand, sewn by hand. I'm just gonna repeat that because it actually it sounds absolutely insane, but we did it. Uh, all sustainable. And, uh, and this is a very heavy brass grinder for cannabis. Um, the other thing to note is when they couldn't sell cannabis, and these are the things that you don't, you don't know till you do it. 48 North did not have, could not sell cannabis because it wasn't legal. But because we had built so many incredible stories, like, like this product, because products for cannabis were so different. They, they had no sense of design. We wanted to design something that actually could live in somebody's house and could ho hold its own beauty without it thinking, oh my God, it's like, you know, it's for cannabis. It actually, you could proudly display it. So everything, all their, all their attention they got was actually for that product. So it just shows you that you don't know where things go and how that uh, small idea becomes actually the entire foundation of every, everything that they were able to build till it got legalized. Um, the next, I'm gonna go a little bit faster, but easiest soulless. Uh, we designed uh, maybe 17 year, the go uh, a dishware line again. I think I've always wanted to go into product. This was called Intento, and I'm going to say it. Uh, Beckett used to say, "You should fail, then fail again, and then fail better." I actually don't agree. I think you should not fail because I don't believe in failure. It's always about trying. You should try, try again, and try better. This is what we did. We decided to try again. 
uh, philosophically, Intento is a poetic intention. And what we were we trying to do, uh, we just launched it into the world. We opened a product design company. So it wasn't just a product this time. And what we were trying to do is honor what was important to us. And for us, again, it's humanity. It's the interconnectedness of people. It's what COVID has revealed. We were thinking about it three years ago. What is important. Enough is plenty. We don't need to consume so much stuff. What we do have in our homes uh, has to have spirit. It has to have meaning. And it is about enjoying, sharing, and honoring those elusive moments of beauty that we have. And that is life. So this we designed, this we explored just for that. Uh, and we built a company. We did it all on our own. We don't have the economy uh, to do all of this. And yet we do. And I think that's the other thing. We, we always embrace uncertainty um, as a new condition of thought to, to question how to design meaning, not only how to design objects. And uh, many times what motivates me is the challenge of a job. Uh, you know, what, what brings me excitement is not knowing how it's gonna be solved or where it's gonna be, take me. Um, the, you know, it's like a horizon. It's, you know, it sounds, it, it's inaccessible, inaccessible to us but there's always an opportunity to move forward and to learn. You know, even the peaks of a, you know how long it took us to do the peaks, the, the little peak of this teapot, you know, like failure and failure and failure, which I would say just, we tried, we tried, we tried, and we did it. Um, and again, this, this just was an experiment within the studio and now it became a company. We, this is our studio, our product, and it's timed by itself this part, so I can't move it faster, I'm so sorry, but as exploring uh, the many issues, the many aspects of the design. We, uh, again, we don't like to do things the normal way. Clearly, we, we just always, we are always pushing wherever we can. So we didn't do the website only uh, on Shopify, which is a, a sort of the purchasing templates. We actually coded and designed it all ourselves, which took us close to eight months. We did all of this designing, launching on the side of running another company. So that shows um, that there is patience and resilience in every project. That time is always on our side. Nobody ever rushes you. Um, and, you know, just see where things go. Because we were doing this, we were able to get the product that you saw at 48 North. We would have never, nobody would have ever trusted us to do product had they not seen this experimentation happening in the studio. So while we experimented, clients got excited and literally paid us to design products, which we would have never ever done. Uh, that's what it takes when you're exploring different spaces and you're, then the ones you're comfortable. And the truth is we know what we, we, we know what we do, but we don't always want to do what we're good at. We actually want to do sometimes what we are not good at and, and become better at it. And then the last one, just to wrap it up, chaos as a way of thinking. I showed you the first image of the laws of disassociation that actually is my brain. And this is actually how we work. Ours is always a poetic act. It opens multiple ambiguous pathways of meaning, a way in which we affect meaning and our projects and hopefully society at large. Um, we, we are passionate explorers uh, trying to push every possible way. Yes, we did a race car and yes, I was the one inside and Chris who did this video sneaked it in, totally sneaked it in. You must always have one grand passion. And this is our next project, an Airstream we bought five years ago with a social intent. And now we're diving right in it. Incredible to think that now suddenly this is the hottest thing on the market. We bought it for absolutely nothing. Um, and I want to end this presentation with a Joseph Campbell um, phrase that says, as you go the way of life, you will see a great, I think you say chasm, I'm always mispronounce it. But the idea is to jump. It is not as wide as you think. This is a, um, an American, uh, uh, in Canada we say indigenous, but uh, you have another word and now the word escaped me, a saying of initiation. And what I love about this is that it holds the, the, just the experience and the experiment of 
just trying and pushing every border possible. Thank you so much, Vanessa. As always, extremely inspiring. So questions from uh, an attendee watch is, um, I think it comes from Finn, Finn Hughes. How do you know which direction to go into? How do you, he said, find difficult to narrow. So how do you go from this global expanse of inspiration of trying so much down to the solution? So, th so there's many different things. If it's narrowing us as a studio, we consider, we try to be undefined. Is it narrowing a project? You, there is something called intuition and listening very well. I do believe, although I always bring into um, a, a, a talk the essence, the fire that inspires us, we're actually incredibly good at listening and going through a process of questioning the client and make sure that we are, are actually listening very well. The, you, when, when you're with a project, it's, you're not the one creating the answers, you're actually revealing them. That's your job. Your job is not to create something. You, you do create uh, the work, but it is revealing their needs. It's revealing where they, not only they're asking, but where they should go as a project. A project like 48 North is a perfect example. It could have been in, its, like, we move that project so expansive. When you have so many options creatively, you follow your instinct. At this point, you more or less start, and, and that's, uh, your instinct is not random. It actually has a knowing, it has experience. And I do think it has many times a much more acute sense of truth than your rational thinking. But it is the combo of everything, of your rational thinking, the listening, the methodology, and then uh, your intuition to follow the path. And, um, but, it is, but, but there is something in that intuition that guides the solution. I, I think that answer is tied watching and I and answers Ty, Ty Drake's question too of your interaction with the client. And I think again, your interaction is holistic. You allow the holistic path to happen so you can reach the solution. Yeah, I think it's, it's collaborative. Um, you know, people use this word and misuse this word, but a great relationship with a client is, is incredibly fun. I, I've ended up being friends with most of them and um, because it's collaborative, you feed on each other, you listen well, then they trust you that you're able to see, okay, well, this is where your art. Did you think about this idea here and you expand the project? I tend to be a very big thinker. I, I, I you know, you're looking at all of my projects, but we are many times the ones proposing you know, we should be doing product, the magazine, the this, the conversation, the article. So we're always pushing our clients into a bigger um, space. Uh, and, and not because we need work. We don't upsell. I actually do not believe in upselling anything. We don't sell. We serve our clients well because we're honest with them. We say the things exactly as they are. I am not here to sort of say what you need me to say. I'm here to collaborate with you and, and do the best for you and the best for the project. Mm -hmm. And that, that type of uh, value, I think is the one that brings us, the projects back to us and, and we're word of mouth. So you need that type of value system. So um, just to shift a little, and I think this is an interesting question. Are you doing your personal social projects? And I, I'm sure I already know how you're gonna answer this and financially sustaining your studio? So you um, maintain balance. I, it's not even a question for me. It is so important uh, in my core and in my soul to pursue them that to start with the very few nonprofits that we, I think I actually can count two that we have not been paid for. I actually, we get paid for most of nonprofit organizations and we get paid for our work. I do believe in getting paid for the work you do, even when they're nonprofits, right. because, I, because you, you, the level of respect is different and the conversation is different. The two times in my entire career, 
uh, and that's long, guys, by the way, that I haven't been paid. It has been actually <laughs> my choice. And I did it as, as my donation to the organization. So it's just been twice in my entire career that I haven't been paid for the job. Uh, everything else, when we have a, a project like the book on systemic racism, which we are pursuing ourselves, I do it because this is the fire in my soul. And, and I think it's important, uh, you know, I have something called the value legacy. I, I thought about this maybe when my kids were born, I have a 15 and a 13 year old, and I call it the value legacy. I, it's for me, it's not about leaving them any money or anything um, material, but it is about showing them that if something bothers you about the world, you might as well just do it, do something about it. Mm -hmm. Small, big, it doesn't matter, it's your intention. So this is my value legacy. And whenever I see something that, that doesn't align to me, I wanna participate in that, in that action. And it's not just doing graphics. I'm gonna clarify, it's not just a, a graphism. I, I actually don't believe in graphism as a response. I believe in action as a response. How much of your cultural upbringing in Argentina do you take with you when you go from Argentina to Toronto, to New York, to LA, to Berlin? Is there always that underlying Argentinian culture that you take with you that affects your choices? Do your choices depend on where you are, what country you're in? Oh, I, it's, you know, I think I take all of the countries and that's a beauty. We are, we are porous, you know, we're porous, open. So you take all of your experiences. I, I, I think it's, you know, you're at the end of the day, an empty vessel and the richer you fill yourself with, with things, with conversations, with, with art, with, um, things that motivate you sometimes with the simplest of things sometimes it's just a you know a, an object in the everyday that feels extraordinary um that is what you take that is the richness that you bring back to a project so it's it's everything and culturally yes you know i do not uh work the same in mexico i, I have a lot of projects in mexico or in latin america as i do in europe or i you you are sensitive to the culture, you understand the nuances, there are nuances, there are differences, and you honor them. And you honor, uh, you work without understanding that there's certain things that actually don't work the same. And that's one of the things I, I love about our studio is that we are so small and still we're so international. Because every time we do a project abroad, there is a learning. It is not, you know, we might share all the information of the world, but there's still, it, it, um, idiosyncrasias in Spanish, but uh, idiosyncrasies or, mm -hmm. or things that happen within a culture that are just different and they're um, shared, shared memories or shared, shared knowledge. I wanna thank you. And I have to tell you, it's been a delight being your colleague and your friend for all of these years. And I've, I've learned so much from you and uh, you're a great inspiration for those who are new in the field and those who are old in the field. So, <laughs> again, and we hope to see Thank you again. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Gloria. You know how much I love you. I say it openly as it should. It's been a pleasure to study with you and it's been a pleasure to keep on writing with you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for coming. It's been truly an inspirational talk and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye guys. Bye.